thing about the Hudson that amazes me the most is that coming down from the Adirondacks and then winding its way through all our communities and through one of the biggest cities on earth is this true wilderness. And it's right under our noses, it's right at our doorsteps. And uh, we take it for granted. And so under the surface, which blocks our view, is this urgent and dynamic web of life. We're at a point where the public, the state, organizations like Riverkeeper are studying the river, studying the species that live here in order to restore it. Atlantic Surgeon will stay in the Hudson for three to five years and they spend the majority of their time in the Highlands, which is the deep section of the river, or in Havishaw Bay. And then when they leave and they go out to the ocean and they spend the majority of their life until they're ready to spawn out in the ocean, moving up and down the coast. Oh, so they're between six and eight feet and the weight is about 100 to 150 pounds a piece. Um, and some days we catch 14 of them and some days we catch, you know, a couple. We have image sturgeon that are twice the size of the ones that you were seeing. So, yeah, I have 14 feet long. Between 25 and 40 percent of their body is gonads, is eggs. If you can imagine it's a 200 pound fish, she has at least 50 pounds of, of eggs in her. I think people love to hear stories about the big fish that swims in the Hudson. It's very intriguing to them and most people don't even know that they're out there. In springtime, the river is alive with fish, whether they be shad or striped bass or sturgeon. And literally millions of baby eels are gathering at the mouths of streams to be able to make their migration upstream, up the waterfalls, into the headwaters of the Hudson. American eels have one of the most amazing migration stories of any animal on the planet. All American eels are hatched in the Sargasso Sea, roughly between Bermuda and Puerto Rico, and then they spend the first year of their life drifting and swimming on currents to rivers and estuaries all along the east coast of North America, including our own Hudson River estuary. And there's still so much to learn about this animal. Like, we haven't seen it spawn in the wild. Uh, we're still not sure why it migrates thousands of miles to go back to the Sargasso Sea. And it's just really interesting to study. It's an amazing feat of evolution, and it's just an amazing feat of adaptation. We have the weir set up here so we can get a count of how many herring are coming in to spawn in the river. We put this up beginning in 2013, so we have annual run counts since then, and the run sizes have ranged from 250,000 to 600,000 herring in a, in a season. They're heroes. They come from the ocean, they migrate, you know, a hundred miles to get here, and they head upstream the whole way, and they come up here with this imperious urge to spawn. And all they want to do is renew their populations. Blue crab and the river herring are the only two species that you can catch for sale. We lost the shad, we lost the striped bass, <laughs> you know, so 
any day now we're going to lose the fishermen, <laughs> you know, as far as endangered species. What I'm trying to do, uh, along with actually catching them and selling the crabs, is to uh, keep the tradition alive, you know, so that it can be passed on. This is a terrific uh, example of a Hudson River blue crab. We used to have shad, but we can't fish for them anymore because of population problems. And we can't fish for striped bass because of other pollutant problems. Ideally, the shad will come back and we'll be able to do that. Ideally, I'll still be doing it so that there's some amount of knowledge on the river about how to do it. One of the things that I love about the Hudson Valley is the enthusiasm of the people who live here to get involved with the river. There's a growing number of people that really love the idea of, hey, I can do something to make the Hudson River better for my community and better for all the nature that lives here. We are part of this web of life. You can't have thriving human populations. People won't do well if the ecosystem isn't doing well. The ecosystem is what gives us clean air. It's what gives us clean water. It's what gives us food. But all these pieces have to fit together. For decades, Riverkeeper and other environmental groups and countless individuals have fought for this river. It's not enough to stop polluters. What we have to do is we have to start giving back to the river what was taken from it. We have to heal these fish that we over -harvest. We have to restore their abundance. The future of this river is entirely in our hands.